Good afternoon. Ooh, I love that. Good afternoon. I am Megan McCorkle, the Chief Marketing Communications and Strategy Officer here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you so much for joining us for a sold out Pratt Writers Live featuring Tamron Hall. First and foremost, I want to thank our donors and our board members. Without their support, we would not be able to offer programs like this for free to the public. I also really want to thank all of the Pratt staff that you see around in the room right now, our programming and outreach team, the audiovisual team, facilities, security, and so much more who work so hard on these events. Please give them a round of applause. We have a lot more great events coming up here at the Pratt Library. In just a few weeks on April 6th, we are going to transform the Central Library into a storybook for Imagination Celebration. This annual free family festival includes free magic shows, music, entertainment, and more celebrating our smallest library customers. You are not going to want to miss it. And later, on April 27th, we'll be hosting a Fix-It Fair in partnership with the Station North Tool Library. So I know you've got those broken things in your home that you're not quite sure how to fix. Bring them on here, and our volunteers are going to do their best to fix them for you. Now, those are just a couple of the programs that we're featuring here at the Central Library. But to make sure you don't miss anything, pick up a copy of our Compass magazine or check out prattlibrary.org. Now, for today's big event... Tamron Hall is an Emmy award-winning host and executive producer of the nationally syndicated Tamron Hall Show. She was previously in your homes every morning on the Today Show. She's the winner of an Edward R. Murrow Award for reporting. Her new book, Watch Where They Hide, is an edge-of-your-seat thriller, and all of you have a copy of that to take home. Yeah. This afternoon, she is in conversation with the host of WEAA's Today with Dr. K, Carsonia Wise Whitehead. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Pratt stage, Tamron Hall and Dr. K. Tamron Hall is in Baltimore. <laughs> Hello. Now, I just want to ask, are there any members of the Tam fam here? Because we want to see you. <laughs> Thank you. This is exciting. It is. I, I mean, I'm, my heart is pounding, and I am so excited and honored. I could just burst into tears. First, thank you, Dr. K, Absolutely. for agreeing to moderate, and thank you for being here. And my son is here, so for him to see all of you be here for me is very special. I don't know if he'll last the whole hour. I've given him a lot of M&Ms, but <laughs> hi, baby. Hi, Moses. <laughs> So this is an honor to have you and to be here with my family. And I just want to recognize someone very special in the audience. I'm going to ask her to stand. But Mama Ernestine is here, the world's oldest bodybuilder. We all know her from the Beyonce video, so I my had to call her My inspiration. Yes, absolutely. Thank my you for My body coming. goals, but I'm not reaching that goal because it's amazing. <laughs> So happy you're here. So I have to start with the most obvious question, which is the most important question, I would argue. You've got to talk about when Prince came to pick you up. <laughs> I got to hear about that first. <laughs> well, my husband is here. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, listen, it is always a surreal experience when anything like that happens. But Prince um, meant a lot of things to me, but I, I can tell you very specifically, there was a time where I was thinking about next chapters and, and what I was going to do with my life. And, and I'd been talking about this idea of a talk show. And then I had that incident where I was no longer on that show. And he said to me, why do you keep waiting on others when you can do it yourself? Mm. 
But the thing about that message was I didn't receive the email until after he passed away. Wow. What happened in my, in my phone, you know, you had labeled some people, your contacts, and his, his, his email was under a contact of the VIP, which normally pops up right away when you open your email and certain people have the little asterisks. And for whatever reason, I didn't see it. And I was, I just lost my job and I was grappling with like, you know, those emotions. And I'm not kidding you. I open an email and this email pops up and I said, wait a minute, I've never seen this before. And this was at a very critical time of me pitching the show and I'm about to give up. And that email that I'd never seen and I'd never read came to me in this mm. darkest, most frightening moment. And I'll never forget it. I still believe it was a direct sign from him, but it said, why are you waiting on others when you can do it yourself? I love that. And it was I liberating. Like so I want to talk about your show. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about your work in the industry. Mm -hmm. And then we'll spend the last half of our hour together talking about the new book that Absolutely. I stayed up all night and Thank read. Thank you. It was quite a read. I'm hoping yes. you haven't slept since you the whole point of the book was to terrorize everybody. <laughs> it terrorized me. Yeah. As a Facebook yeah. user, yeah. it absolutely terrorized well, me. I, I came out in this little innocent pink, but really it's like a black monster under here. Like, <laughs> I want to say, yeah, so this is all a distraction of the book. It's definitely very scary. I kept kicking my husband and waking him up. <laughs> you got to get up with me. But I want to talk about your show first. Yes. Um, and there was an episode you did called Unapologetically Me. Mm. And I just want to have you speak about how you have this incredible range on your show mm -hmm. and how you consider yourself to be a storyteller for the people. You know, when we launched the show, um, we're going around pitching and different um, organizations would say, different networks and different uh, TV groups, they would constantly say, well, people don't have an attention span anymore. People want you to come out. They want you to do a couple of things and blah, blah, blah. And at the time, um, Wendy Williams, who... And I've been very, very clear about this. It's not the type of show that I would have ever done, but I always applaud her for 10 seasons right. to do it on her own, no matter the content, a woman in a chair maintaining. And, and, and so at the time, Wendy was in her biggest glory moment, and I would go into meetings and they'd say, we want you to do hot topics. And I said, well, I don't do hot topics. That's not my thing. That is specific and very well done by Wendy. And then I would often hear people say, well, can't you just give us your opinion? Like, uh-uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> and I remember being in a meeting with this man who happened to be white. And he said, no, -uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> and I was like, hi, my name is Tamron Hall. Have you ever seen anything that I've ever done? I was like, and, and I realized that so many of these people have caricatures of what women are like, caricatures of what black women are like. And I was like, well, these aren't the conversations that me and my friends and my family are having. So let me tell you the conversations that me and my friends and my family and the women around me are actually having. And over time, thank you. And I, I you know, I had to go in very, very direct and very clear and say, this is the show. And in the first two months of the show, I got a lot of um, negative press because I decided to change the executive producer of the show. I am the executive producer yes, and creator of that. the show, but yeah. I had someone who started the show with me and who originally said, I believe in this vision. I believe in a one hour conversation you know, I always tell people my favorite movie is Shrek. I know. You didn't expect that. <laughs> didn't expect that. Like, you put me in a room with the original car wash and Shrek, you won't hear from me. That's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my wicked combo. And in the movie, Eddie Murphy, who I adore, this character, the donkey, he's like, we are layers, like a parfait. And then Shrek says, like an onion? He's like, no, like a parfait. <laughs> and I love that because we're all layers. You know, if you sit down and you talk to somebody only about sports, if it's not the Orioles or the Ravens, they may not want to hear your conversation. If you only talk about fashion, they might say, okay, well, that's it. If you only talk about this or that. But imagine when you sit down and you have a wide-ranging conversation. When I get on the phone with my mom, 
we go through everything. Like, did you see Risa Tisa? I did. Did you see <laughs> what? And the weather today? What? You know, our conversation is all over the place. And I wanted to reflect those conversations. What are you reading? Did you watch it on TV? Blah, blah, blah. And as a result, every show has an intention. Every show has its own identity. But the whole idea of the show is to have a conversation. Sometimes it's light and easy. Sometimes it's heavier, but it's just to have a conversation. Now you have a number of different conversations. You yeah. bring on regular people, but you also bring on celebrities. Yes. Now what is a story that you haven't told yet that you're waiting to tell? Who do you really want to talk to? I truly believe that God in the universe brings the guests that I'm supposed to talk mm. to. Mm. Because I used to have like dream guests and celebrities and then they would come on and I'm very defensive about the TAM fam. So I've had to tell people, you're not doing us any favors. If you want to come on and talk, we're here. But when people come on and they don't want to answer or they, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I just met Eric and Linda. They are doing a great job with helping children and people who face challenges. And when they're pulled over, an, a, a person of authority may not know. And, and on this ID card, it shows you if they have autism. Sometimes you can't see someone's challenge. And imagine a police officer pulling you over and not knowing that you have a specific disability and process that as you not complying. And then that person loses their life. That's for me, I'd rather talk to Eric and Linda than a celebrity who doesn't want to be on the show. Can I have them stand up? Eric and Linda here on the front row. And so, and so for me, what we do, we meet my, Kiana Burns is my executive producer. She's a black woman. Um, I have most of my staff. And listen, and let me say, I do not alienate men. I was raised by a phenomenal dad <laughs> who was in the army for 30 years and who was a great cook and the, and the dad that God meant for me to have. Um, but I also know how it feels to be a woman and a woman of color left out of the room. Yes. So my staff is probably 60% women. I have a co-executive producer who's a woman, a director who's a woman. I love it. Um, for the first time in my career, the person who controls the audio is a black woman. I've been in this business 30 years. I never saw crew members that were women of color. You know, and, and you walk in and it's like this cameraman, this guy. And I noticed that a lot of the productions were almost all men and almost all white men. We talk a lot about what you see on TV, right? right. The screen, but I understand behind the scenes what it meant. So our, our show has a, a rich layer of great people who understand the assignment. And our assignment is to give the TAM fam a quality show. So the guests, going back to the direct question that you asked me, it's not a guess, it's a feeling. And the feeling is come to talk, respect that I have a valuable audience, respect my audience's time, and understand that this great opportunity you have to sell your book, magazine, or whatever, it's my TAM fam. So All you right. got to get up and talk. That's how I see it. Oh, I love that. I was thinking about some of the shows I watched coming up and how I would see myself on the screen. Now, Bill Cosby person aside, the Cosby show gave me a vision of what I wanted for a black marriage. A different world spoke to me about going to an HBCU. Mm. Who do you want to see your show and how do you want them to see themselves? Well, that's a phenomenal question. I've never been asked that, but I can tell you my so what did Jay-Z say at the Grammys? When I get nervous, I tell the truth. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> I'm kind of wired that way. So when I learned that I was going, I'll tell you, I'll even give you more truth. My husband knows I'm a choir. Today, I got on the train. I changed my train ticket yesterday because they had a wrong seat. They put my train ticket in the right seat. We got on the train, and this is a true story. I got on the train today, and for the first time since I left the Today Show, I walked past the man who fired me. Mm. Mm. And I'll tell you, I, and these are not tears of sadness. These are tears of great joy. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
And by the way, he never, my husband knows, he didn't look up at me. I saw him first and I walked by and I don't think he realized it was me. And that was okay because he was gonna realize it was me getting out. So I walked really slowly past him. <laughs> I was literally like this. <laughs> because I was walking in, thank, thank you, you so much. I was getting ready to walk into this room with all of you here to see me and the work that we do on the Tamron Hall Show. I was walking with the child I never expected to have. I was walking in my space in my place of joy because of this event. So I was even more empowered. And I'll tell you, and the reason why I shared that story is because the day that, you know, I was let go and, and that was okay. And I, I, I'm honestly, I laugh about it. I laughed about it then in some really weird way and I'm not even sure why because I've worked my entire life. I've worked since I was 14 years old. And I never not had a job, to be honest with you. But my mother called me that night and my mother said to me, very specifically, because my grandfather was a sharecropper. He was born in 1901. So the words that I write and the words I make my living with, he couldn't read. And so that's always given me great perspective. I grew up at a time where my grandparents, you know, were hardworking people, but as we know, invisible people. So my mother said to me a couple of things. She said, thank you for standing on the sidewalk because so many times your grandmother had to get off the sidewalk so a white woman could walk on that sidewalk. And when I left that day, I thought a lot about all of the young women who are in college right now. And I said, oh gosh, they're gonna see the headline, Tamron Hall got replaced. And I thought in my mind at that moment, I thought in my mind at the moment, I said, I have to fight because if they see me lose, what chance do they think they have? Because I was the first black woman to ever host the Today Show. So if she gets the boot, I don't stand a chance. And so I said, oh, you will. You will stand a chance and you're going to see me do something that nobody else has ever done. Because normally when you get taken off at a network level, you turn into the person that somebody ran into and say, I think I saw her at the Pratt Library. Was that her? <laughs> Looked like her. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. So I looked at my friend, Ann Curry, who went on to have a different show. I looked at other people and I said, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure it out for all of those young women who come up to me and say, I admire you. And I was going to show them, I walk it like I talk it. And I'm going to fight back. I'm going to fight back with dignity. I'm going to fight back unapologetically. I'm not going to go on a rant on social media. I'm going to let my success win. I love that. So I want to ask you about being a black woman. Hmm. Because you mentioned earlier about the son you never thought. Yeah. I know that before I had my sons, my stories were different. Yeah. And then I started writing for the stories that I wanted their children to one day yeah. read. How did having a son, being a black mother at this time with everything that is going on, how did that change the stories that you're telling and that you're looking to tell? You know, it, it, thank you again for that question because it changed the way, I, it, it really made me focus on entrepreneurship and ownership and, and, and not just having a seat at the table, but truly owning the table. Mm. And for me, you know, that's why you see a lot of up and coming designers. You see authors that you may not know. You see people who've started businesses. That's very important to me. Um, the pandemic happened and I will never forget, we interviewed a black female truck driver who, when I tell you, I, I wish I had a drop of her blood in me. Mm. She was driving and delivering all of these things by herself with a smile on her face. And I'm just, I stood in awe really of her greatness. Cause to me, those, that's a great person. And even now that I have my son, when I started out this show, I was a journalist. I was like, okay, I'm going to do my thing. And I'm going to do a you know, talk show. I didn't realize it was a business. And I have 250 people that work on the team. And that's a big responsibility. But people don't realize, I didn't realize how much of it is business. A lot of my time is spent like in business and budget meetings and things like that. 
I, before the show, I'm not kidding you. If you, if I gave you $5, you gave me my change, I was not counting. I'd be like, God, <laughs> hope they didn't try to cheat me. Uh, Cause I'm a really good writer and clearly I talk a lot, but I've, math has never been my business. Thank God for whoever invented the calculator, not that Ascabus thing or whatever that thing is. You have to move the little balls. I was as simple as whatever. I need a cal. Thank you. Okay. It's calculator. That's me. So, but I, I started to, through watching women on the show in particular that we had on who had written their own books, who, you know, had their own content creators, I was inspired to be a better businesswoman myself. And so that's where the content is. I, I really love those kinds of shows. Our up and coming fashion design series, it's not just about beautiful clothes. Those, we had a nurse on who is a nurse by day and made a gown for me in 24 hours. Wow. That when I came out, I, I couldn't believe it. Jesus wept. I mean, it just was insane. <laughs> it was insane. But it was phenomenal to see that, that entrepreneurial spirit in her not die. People, you know, i be very honest with you. I've debated, we're in our fifth season. And the reason why you haven't heard the announcement, there is one. I was really grappling of where I am in my life. Because I wasn't sure I wanted to keep doing the show. Not because I don't love the show, but I'm very very conscious about owning my name and owning what I do. And I do own a portion of the show, but not all of it. But I love seeing like Tabitha Browns and people on who really write and own their content yes. because that is the next frontier for us as women and as black women is owning our content. Because yes. I still don't get paid for deadline crime and they run it every day. Yes. And I look at it every day going, what did I sign? <laughs> But now if Deadline Crime ever came back, I would own Deadline Crime. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, um, and I want to say I appreciate you saying in the back, I can ask you anything. You can ask me anything. And the only question that I ask permission about mm -hmm. is being able to talk about your sister. Because mm -hmm. I know for so many years, you did not. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what happened to your sister and how that informed your work on deadline crime. And even with Jordan yeah. Manning, I see it coming out of there as well. And Dr. K is so true. And she, she said, can I ask you anything? I said, absolutely, except for how much money I make. No, I didn't. <laughs> the one question I had, I right? Did, <laughs> I did not say that. I said, you can ask me anything because that's one of the things about our show. You know, people on our, you know, sometimes folks will come on and they'll say, well, you can't ask me this and you can't ask me that. And I say, well, this is not the place for you because I don't want to run into any of you anywhere and be like, why you didn't ask her? <laughs> they said I couldn't. What? You know, I, don't, I hate that feeling. So that's why I said it. But going to my sister, um, my sister, my entire life. So just going back a beat. My mother was a 19-year-old single mom. And um, my biological father, who is still alive, um, we never really had a relationship. My mother married my, the father that God meant for me to have, Clarence Newton Sr. Um, short but long story. Uh, he was our landlord. <laughs> it's a true story. And we recently did an age difference show. I don't know if you saw, we did like age gap relationships and it re-aired the other day. True story. My mother called me, she said, I'm going to sue you if you show this episode again. Because in addition to being our landlord, my dad is 25 years older than my mom. And in addition to that, she was his third wife. Playa, playa, playa. <laughs> that said, my father cooked every meal for us. My father, the day he passed away and closed his eyes, I saw pure love between my parents. Mm. And I actually used to jokingly say, I didn't know women could cook because my mother cannot cook. And my dad did all of the cooking. All of the, my dad would make fresh lunches and drive it to school because he'd be like, he eat that cafeteria food. I don't know that he's kind of like Bernie Mac a little bit. Um, and so he would like bring food to us. And so when my mom married the landlord, <laughs> AKA my dad, 
uh, we became a blended family. I have a younger brother who's eight years younger than me, but suddenly I had an older brother and an older sister, Renata, who I thought was the flyest, coolest, most glamorous person. Um, we were looking back at some of our videos and she would just you know, do my hair. I, I used to have much longer hair than this and I cut my hair after Anita Baker, my boyfriend who was from Maryland. <laughs> had a crush on Anita Baker and he liked somebody else more than me. I was like, I got you girl. Cut my hair. <laughs> and that's how the haircut, honest to God. And he hates it when I, cause he's married and he hates when I tell the story, but it's true. Um, and so, you know, but she was always so elegant and so uh, amazing, but also so troubled. Um, you know, my, there was always a guy in her life who didn't appreciate her. And there was always some story that I would hear in the background, you know, she was older than me and I'd hear these stories in the background about, you know, this or that problem. She was always in something. And over time she started to get things together. You know, we all evolve at different times. My son is four years old right now. You know, sometimes I, he goes to school and there, I had to write a teacher back the other day because he said, she said, he pay, plays tag and he uses his whole hand, not two fingers. And I was like, Google rule of <laughs> tag. And I wrote, eh? this is a diagram a whole hand. And I said that because I'm in the throes of, you know, kids learn in their own way at their own time. And so people evolve in their own way. You make mistakes and you rebound from them. So later, Life, she started to rebound from mistakes. Um, mistakes that included having a struggle with alcohol addiction and other things. Over time, she started to get her life together and she started seeing someone that none of us were fans of in our home. And we're the kind of family that we won't just say it we have these rashes of inappropriate opinions <laughs> and then there's that weird silence. And so when we, this person came into my sister's life, I'll never forget. He left, they left. And my dad, again, in his Bernie Mac way, goes, what do you think of him? I said, I don't know, dad. It's something about him. Something about him. I don't care for him. And my dad said, he kept calling me father-in-law. Yeah, ain't my married to my daughter. What are you talking about father-in-law? <laughs> so we noticed this instant trying to ingratiate himself to us, right? And that can be a fine thing, but in reflection, we now recognize these things. So over time, you know, we just kind of put up with him and we didn't know the, the level of, of what she was going through. I was a news anchor in Chicago and my sister had wanted to come in, see me. And so I was very excited because now I'm this, you know, I'm the cool sister. I'm the news anchor in Chicago. I've got drip. I, you know, I'm like, come see me. I got a Sebring convertible. I'm going to take you around Chicago. <laughs> you know, I thought I was doing it. And so I was so happy to have my big sister come and see me accomplished. And I invited her in and the individual uh, came with her. And that night I heard a commotion downstairs. I lived in like a little townhouse and I hear this commotion. I run downstairs and my sister uh, is bleeding. She has a huge knot. My house is torn apart and he's standing there. And he said, we got into, you know, these stories. And I said, get out, get out right now. And I remember I ran to the closet, I got a broom and I started just swinging, not to hit him, but just to get out, get out, get out, get out. He left, I called my dad and my dad was like, I locked the door, you know, and I, and I, and I debated calling the police. And I said, I can't call them on TV. They're going to know the police came to the house. And I'm like, you got to get this person out of your life. Look at what you're doing. And now you're here with me. And if I call the police, you're going to ruin me. She goes to sleep. I put her to bed, take care of her. I go upstairs. I come down the next morning. She has snuck him back into my home. And I said, in a rage, get out, both of you get out, get out, get out, get out. And I kicked them both out. I was just so mad at her. And I was like, can't you see you can do better? You're already doing, what is wrong with you? We didn't talk for a couple of months. My dad does not play that. 
he called and he said, you're going to fix this before Thanksgiving. Because I'm not going to sit in the house with you all not talking to each other. So I said, okay. Came home. I called her. She was getting her nails done. And um, we made nice and never talked about it again. Went on, never talked about it again. A short time later, she was killed. And it was a Sunday, and my dad called, and he said, uh, the police are at her house. They're saying something happened at Renata's house. But I could tell by his voice, it was not just something. It was bigger. Called my mother immediately. She was on her way to church. She'd pulled over. She was sobbing. And she said that she'd been found dead in her swimming pool in her home. And the individual was there, but said that she'd fallen asleep. My mother instantly recalled a conversation that she'd had the night before where my sister said, I'm ready to leave. And we believe that person heard the conversation. And what we know statistically is when a person is in a violent relationship, the most dangerous time is when you're preparing to leave. The investigator told me and my family that they knew who did it, but they couldn't prove it. And that, to your question, how it dovetails into this book and the story is like all of you, you know, you hear deadline crime, they had DNA, DNA solved it, right? When I said to the detective, what about DNA? He said, well, if you live with someone, their DNA is all over you. So that's why this character is a forensic scientist because so much of what I learned in that process bucks what you see on TV, you know, 48 Hours, CSI, great shows, but there are so many cases that go, first of all, there's so many people who are wrongfully convicted by DNA, and I've interviewed many, and then there's an absence of it in cases like this. So a couple of things happened after my sister's murder. I went to an event where some young girls who were 15 and 16 years old started to share their stories of surviving domestic abuse. That was an awakening because you don't think of a 12-year-old being beaten in a relationship, and they were. So we have a saying where I'm from, fair exchange, no robbery. And I felt like they were sharing their story with me and I was keeping this secret. So I started to reveal and talk about my sister's journey, talk about learning now, how to help family members, because you know, I don't speak from a perspective of somebody who's experienced domestic violence in that way, but we all have loved ones. You know somebody, and you don't know how to sometimes. I grew up tough love, right? You can do bad by yourself. You don't need this guy realizing that that was not the way to reach her. So now I use my experience and share her story so that someone's sister, mother, brother, friend, whatever it is, that person in your life, that through my sharing Renata's relationship with me and me not knowing, a woman who is very long-winded, not knowing what to say to my sister, someone I just admired. That's the challenge. And so people ask me when you're faced with that, if you love someone that's experiencing domestic violence, what do you do? And I'll, I wish I had just listened. I wish I had just asked a couple more times, are you okay? I wish I had said, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Now, those simple things of showing someone support without telling them what to do can bring people to the table. And when they feel comfortable, they'll open up. And I didn't make her feel that she could come to the table. I was trying to solve it for her versus saying, when you're ready, no judgment. I'm here. And in this book, this new book, so the first book was really inspired by two cases that I'd covered, one in Chicago of a missing young black girl whose case and how people talked about it in the newsroom always troubled me and just stuck with me. So the first Jordan Manning novel is about her investigating the disappearance of a young black girl and the difference and the disparity in that, which we talk about a lot. And then this book, there's a missing mother of two. And her sister goes to Jordan Manning begging for help. And when I finished the book, I realized that I, Jordan is inspired by me, and she is me. But in this book, Shelley, the desperate sister begging for help. Because I didn't know at the time, I wasn't a national figure. I was in local news. And the detective's advice to us at the time was, 
why don't you advertise in Crime Stoppers? And I was like, because we know who did it. <laughs> not a mystery. I'm not going to waste my parents' money on Crime Stoppers, which we would support if it was somebody. But we knew who did it. So you see a lot of Shelley in this book who really expresses the helplessness that I felt, the embarrassment, right? Because even though I wasn't national, I was a big deal in Chicago, and I felt like I can't help my dad. And my dad died soon after. And my mother always believed that he died of a broken heart because your role as a dad, in his view, was to protect your child. And it created a lot of sadness, but, but, it also, when the time was right, empowered us to speak up for families and survivors of domestic violence. My sister's son came on our show for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. He talked about what it was like to tell his son why grandmom is not here, because my, my sister is crazy. I can't even imagine her as a grandmom, because my <laughs> sister was the wild card. My sister's a person um, at the family <laughs> reunion, you're just like, you can't give that baby chicken, they'll choke. <laughs> She'd be like, have some chicken, two-year-old. <laughs> and we would just be laughing. She was very mischievous, but I hope that I've made her proud. And I hope that through me sharing her story and how much guilt I felt, and, and I still do, that other people will find a way It's like the Tamron Hall show again. I'm like, yeah. Dr. K will make them cry. I know. <laughs> Dr. K, you got Tam Fam tears in here. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And that's why I wanted to ask for permission thank because you. when I read about your sister and I went and watched that interview uh, with your nephew, which was really moving. Thank you. And then when I read the book, I was trying to figure yeah. out in this book, I'm like, who is Tamron in the uh, book? Because you're not Jordan Manning. No, no, I'm not Jordan. Because Jordan's now in her 30s. Mm -hmm. She is, you know, a reporter on her way up the ladder. She's now looking at being an anchor. She's got this moniker of Justice Jordan because she's helped solve the case in the first book. And people ask me, do you have to read the first to understand the second? I wanted it to be freestanding because I wanted her to feel just like I feel in this room. Like you've known, you know, I like that energy when you meet somebody and you're like, I know you. Like, I, I love that because I do think that there are these connections that we can't see. So Jordan is freestanding. Now she's Justice Jordan because she solved this big case. But now also she is teetering and coming so close to being a vigilante. because She doesn't want to just be a witness. She wants to be a participant. And that came from, started out in local news. I went to Temple University. Um, thank you to you in the house. <laughs> one, one person. <laughs> one person. <laughs> there she That's is. okay, because I'm going to give you a picture. The rest of them not going to get one. How about that? How about now? How about now? I'll bet you apply next year, won't you? Tell your kids, don't try it too late. I'm not buying it. I need to see your diploma. No. <laughs> But yeah, so Jordan is climbing the ladder, but she, you know, when I started out reporting, I went to college, they teach you, you know, law and ethics, how to write a story, how to construct. Nothing prepared me when I first started out, me and my camera guy, Chris Mathis, we get to the scene, because back when I started, I had scanners, that's how old I am, the scanners, and um, we got to the scene of a robbery in South Oak Cliff, Texas, south side of Chicago, where Erica Badu is from, this area, South Oak Cliff, and there had been a robbery of a barber beauty shop and gunfires, whatever was heard. I get there on the scene and I'm like, it's, we're both in the car. I'm never, we're in a white Taurus because that was the news cars back then. I'm like, Chris has a body. He's like, what? And we're like getting closer and closer. And I see this man on the ground. And there's a minute where we're, I remember so waiting for him to get up, right? Because you're like, this is not real. And I start to see blood. And I recall things very, that's why I write novels, because I, I have a vivid memory about certain things. And I remember thinking, I didn't know blood was that red because I'd only had like, you know, a shot or whatever. And I was like, I didn't know blood was that thick. What? And a car starts to pull up. And it's a Lexus gray sedan. 
And there's a woman, and she's getting closer. And I can see her face, and it's, there are no police officers. This is part of town that the response was slow. So no police officers, no ambulance, no nothing, yet. She comes close enough, jumps out of the car, and you'll appreciate it because you're in radio. Her radio was on, and I'll never forget, because I couldn't listen to this song for a very long time, Unbreak My Heart by Tony Braxton was playing. And I could hear it, it was like a movie, and she's getting out, and, she, and it's his wife. And I'm going, wait, and I grabbed her and I started hugging her, and she's screaming, and it was like, is this my job? I didn't, I signed up to stand in front of and do like the weather, like it's a heat wave, <laughs> right? I, like her, maybe a political scandal. And I'm there between a grieving wife, a man who's the victim of violent crime, and I'm a reporter. So over the years, there were so many moments like that and so many stories that with Jordan, I was able to kind of have therapy because I did, and I do feel, there should be like a class to prepare you as a journalist, especially if you're going to be a local reporter. No one prepares you for that. I, the last episode of Deadline Crime, I was pregnant and I was like, I can't do this show anymore because it was a woman who was murdered and she was pregnant and she was stabbed 19 times. And I was walking the area where she was and she was murdered in the middle of the night. And I kept like imagining her last minutes and like the fear and you know she's fighting for her life and all of these things and so with Jordan I'm able to give her credibility in the space of crime reporting but give myself and the reader escapism through fiction so that's why I can jokingly say but seriously say the ending you know I wanted it to have twists and turns she is also the only black female journalist protagonist written by a black female journalist in all of books. It doesn't exist. And I know that sounds like a lie, except for I sold this book, four publishers wanted to buy it. And they said, and these are the publishers in the country, in the world, you cannot find a black female crime solving journalist written by a black female. And that doesn't mean that people haven't pitched it. It means to get our heroines in the room, sometimes it takes a bigger name. And if I hadn't had five seasons and two Emmys, I don't think they would have bought the book. I know. Oh, I love it. So I do want to ask you some specifics about the book. Yes. And then we have some questions oh, yes, from the please, audience. Yes. So I underline a couple of things oh, boy. that, that concern me. Dr. K's on the case. <laughs> I'm on the case. I want to okay, talk Dr. about Dr. K. You take it I'm, easy on I'm me. Saying, it's like my no, second well, novel. I mean, it's good, but I'm hoping it's, it's Dr. K. Good. <laughs> it is good. I got questions about Nate. Nate. So we have to, We got to talk about. Okay, Nate. so this is great. Nate's her love uh, interest. Sorta. Love interest. So I sorta. wanted it not just to be a crime thriller. I wanted her to be a 360, especially since they told me that this black female protagonist doesn't exist. So I wanted her to have friends. So you see her friend circle because I have a. I had the same best friend since I was four years old, and the only reason. We are friends is because I ran track until college. She's the only woman to ever beat me running. She's the reason I'm a journalist. Because if I was still running, I would be Shikari. <laughs> but she beat me and smoked me so bad, it just my career just went up. So same best friend. I love that she has a love story or love stories. She's in her 30s. She loves her work. She loves her job almost too much. But she's normal. She wants to wake up to somebody other than her red wine every night <laughs> or in the morning. I mean, she doesn't have a drinking problem, but you know what I mean. And she drinks a lot. She does drink a lot. <laughs> Dr. K, judge much? Because <laughs> I'm going to have a drink right after this. And some Cocos. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to start a battle. Cocos is the best. I don't care about your favorite. It's the best. It's the best. Your favorite is your favorite. Coco is mine. <laughs> so, and so, you know, I wanted her to have a, a love life. I wanted you to see, I, I really thought a lot about Waiting to Exhale mm -hmm. and how I felt seeing Waiting to Exhale or Love Jones or any of those things where you feel that, you know, Justice Lyrics. I mean, those are the movies that I, I watch a lot. So Jason's Lyrics. So that's where it is. So Nate is in her life. 
But Nate is a problem. He's a problem. Yeah. As are most <laughs> men. He's a problem. Nate's a problem. <laughs> My dad was married how many times? Three. <laughs> so Nate is trying to get it right. But she's a workaholic. Mm -hmm. And he wants to be in her life. But she is working and trying to solve. She thinks she's saving someone's life. Right. So does she have time for love? That's her, her question to herself. I like I did like that part. I but mean, he's he handsome. shows up. You, you Do I write to, him like he's she handsome? She talks about he, but you talk about how he's a kind of handsome that has to grow on. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that's the kind of handsome I like. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, you, you wrote that part very lovingly, I noticed. Now <laughs> but I want to ask you because I'm wondering where Jordan Manning goes from here. So mm. you I don't want to give away the ending, yeah. but yeah. it is a big question for her yeah. so. because she's looking at how the industry's changing. She's talking about Facebook and mm -hmm. putting all of your ideas and your thoughts and everywhere you are out online. Yeah. And she seems to be conflicted. Where else are you taking well, this character? Well, so for me, looking at Jordan, first of all, it's written in 2008, 2009, because it was a big year in my life. That's the year I came to MSNBC. That was the year Twitter started. That was the year Pre President Obama. I mean, life changed in so many ways. And so that's why that year was very important to me. It's also the year I lost my father. So this, that year has a very important structure. But through technology, one of the things that people don't know about me, my, Johnny is here, my hairstylist, Johnny. Shout out, Johnny. Um, <laughs> Johnny was also Michelle Obama. The only, we, he's been my hairstylist for 20 years, and the only break we had was when he was with Mrs. Obama. He calls me new next now because we cannot walk past any electronic that I don't buy, and then it sits on my table, and I'm like, how do I get this thing to work? <laughs> so, so I love digital. We just found a camera that we bought 10 years ago, and I'm like, I never used it because I love gadgets. So that's where you see the storyline of the gadgets and technology. The other reason you see the technology, as I said, this is inspired by real cases I covered. One of them was in Virginia. Um, it ended in Michigan. The woman was missing for eight years until she was found, um, her remains were found. Her husband was convicted. And when he can finally confess, it was because they gave him an Xbox. Mm. True story. Mm. One of the craziest stories I ever covered. And he met an accomplice online. So that's why you see the digital footprint right. here. But going back to where she's going, I'm already writing the third book. Um, and I, I have started to dig into what does a vigilante, how, how does a vigilante become a vigilante? And she's a reporter right now, and she's climbing the ladder. A lot of people would want that cushy job, right? And, and not that it's a cushy job, but it is. Okay, so you, she's going to be the anchor. She could be making millions of dollars in Chicago reading the news at 10. But the vigilante in her, mm. you know, we're going to start to hear more of her origin story, which does involve violence early in her life and her family. And now I feel that she is capable of doing things that push her moral compass. And I keep asking myself this. If, for example, you knew a child was in harm's way and getting that child out of harm's way meant kidnapping them, mm -hmm. would you? Because that's a crime. Okay. Like, how far would you go to stop someone from doing something? There's a case right now in New York, the subway shooting that happened. The gentleman was charged and then let go because there was an altercation. Right. Yeah. The man had a gun. Mm -hmm. The, 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 a man came on the subway with a gun. He was allegedly aggressive. He and this guy get into it. The guy gets the gun and kills him. So is that wrong? Should he have figured out a way to not use the gun? That's I love the that. challenge, right? What's your moral compass? I saw a woman, um, I was somewhere at a store and mm. I saw this woman hit this child so hard that the back of his back, you know how your back has a barreling sound? Yes. And she hit him so hard. And I turned and he wasn't, he was just being a kid. He was like in this, uh, the rack, you know how the rack goes around. And he was, and she hit him and I heard it. I could have killed her. Mm. I was so angry. I was like, and he was like a little three, four year old. I was so how many times have you said, I, oh, that is where I'm worried about Jordan mm -hmm. because I don't know if she, 
I know she's a good person. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this desire to right the wrongs mm -hmm. will stop. That's where I want her to go, though. You want her I, to I, I, do, I, want, I want her to go all the way there. Dr. K wants some <laughs> dirty, hairy, clitty. <laughs> Jordan in the back with a cigarette. <laughs> there they go, chair. right there. <laughs> because she's just that layered and just yeah. that interesting. No, I, I, I don't think she's going to end up on national news fire. Yeah, now, let's put I, it that way. Yeah, I think, yeah. I I mean, think her storyline. We don't see that, though. We yeah. don't see. We talk about black women yeah. on the page mm -hmm. actually saying, here's a child that is in danger yeah. from their own parents. Yeah. And I have to step in and do something. No, yeah, that's where I, I that shows feel up like, in a Jordan Manning book. I just want you to yeah, no, spell I mean, my Dr. Name K right. gave me the idea. <laughs> Dr. K's gonna be suing me for residuals or whatever they call it. No, I do like the character. I like the idea of this black female character solving crime and doing it in this really authentic way. And so, you know, she's from Texas like me. And over time, I do want people to get to know the family and the mm. roots of her. And I do like that she still loves fashion. Yes. I mean, I write a lot about her feet hurting in her stilettos because I spent a lot of, I have on open toe today for a reason. <laughs> because, you know, you'd go on a report, you know, when I was a reporter, you'd get there and they're going to send you out. You don't know where they're going to send you. And I, walk, I showed up in my little sensible theory suit <laughs> and my heels. And they're like, you're going to stand in front of this thing forever. I remember, <laughs> this is a horrible story, but I'm going to tell you real quick. <laughs> I remember gonna, they said there was a guy barricaded in, he had done some horrible things and was barricaded inside this um, home. We waited, oh boy, almost oh, 18, 19 hours for him to come out. I had on heels and all my male colleagues are in shoes. And everyone kept saying, why didn't you bring your flats? And I had those little roll-up ballet flats. I forgot them in my office drawer. And I'm standing, my feet are killing me. And they're like, Tamron Hall is standing out at the scene. <laughs> and I am like, my feet hurt. That's all I can think about. If you could hear the things I think in my head as a reporter, I was like, my feet are killing me, Robin and Ted. That's in my mind. But I didn't say that. I gave the report. Only for them to find out the man was not in there. <laughs> Wait, what kind of deputy dog detective did know this man was in this place? My feet are killing me. Wasn't in there. Wasn't in there. I don't know what they thought, but my feet, and I know you understand this, ladies, you have tight shoes on, and then when you get home and you take the shoe off, and each toe, you're like this. And you're telling like, ah. Those are the random things about reporting as a female woman wearing high heels that you don't know. But I'll never, I'm like, ah, my feet. I'm sure no one's ever told that story in the Pratt Beautiful Library. I'm like, I'm in this iconic building telling how my feet hurt in high heels. But it's true. So each chapter has a stiletto because each shoe represents one toe released. <laughs> from the prisons of high heels. <laughs> I love that. I do have a question from the audience. Angela Womack gave me a question. For oh, me. hey. And Womack and Womack, one of my favorite Angela. songs. Hey, stay. Yeah, come if on. Angela, I chose you because of your last name, girl. <laughs> so she says, this is your second thriller book. Yes. Will you consider writing a children's book so that I'm Moses and his friends can read your book? Well, thank you for, I have sold a children's book. It's called Harlem Honey. Hi. Um, and we're working on the illustrations right now because I know that as a woman of color, I did not like the first illustrations. I'll just be honest. I was like, I need, the shade is off a little bit. So we're working on the illustrations, but it's a love letter to Harlem. My son was born in Harlem. Uh, Strivers Row is where we live. And so it's, it's meant to be a travel series, a modern travel series. And the goal with the series um, is to have this little character and his two friends travel to iconic neighborhoods around the world that are, you know, neighborhoods that people don't know exist anymore. So like Strivers Row, we start there. And, you know, South Oak Cliff, Texas, everybody's into like the Black Cowboy, Black Rodeo. Um, we were here 
with the road the, with the, the man who has the horse ranch out in Baltimore yes. when we were here. So it's supposed to be a love letter to travel to undiscovered and untalked about modern neighborhoods. So I sold that. I have a cookbook coming out in September. Um, a love letter to my, well, you haven't eaten it yet. Do not clap. Um, <laughs> you're like, you noticed what? I just nodded. I was like, no, really? I will. No, I can. No, I can. My husband is gone, but Johnny will tell. I, can I cook Johnny? Yes, she can. Oh, Don't you do that. <laughs> I'll mess my hair up right now. You send you into tears. Um, no, it's 83 recipes. Um, I started to cook when my father passed away. As I said, my dad did all the cooking. And um, right after my dad passed away, our first Thanksgiving, we went from having sweet potato pie, you know, pecan pie, two and three turkeys, honey baked ham, all that, because my dad was a big family cook, to my mom having nothing. And I said, Mom, we have to create new traditions. Someone gave me that advice. They said, you have to create new traditions. And so we, we have a rule now on vacation, and Johnny knows this, we go to, it has to have two things. Has to have a beach and a casino. Mm. <laughs> My mother is the penny slot queen. <laughs> Literally, recently called me and was like, guess how much I won? <laughs> how much, mom? $25,000. I'm like, what? <laughs> She's like, yeah, penny slots. She sends me a video and it's like, clink, 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 clink. And all her and her church friends are like, yes, yeah, <laughs> What? First of all, it was a Sunday, and they all have the Holy Ghost around this Wheel of Fortune penny machine. And I, but then I started to like sober up in my thoughts because I'm like, oh, twenty five thousand. Then I'm like, Mom, how much have you lost over time? I'm like, they just gave you your money back over the ten years. So it's that. It's a it's a casino for her and a beach for us, and we hang out. But one of the other traditions was I was going to learn to cook as a love letter to my father. So I set out on this journey since 2008 um, to really learn, and it's called a confident cook. So there's 80, you know, 83 recipes. It's really fun, uh, and I can't wait for that to come out. And um, I'm working on another book uh, inspired by from when I lost my job to now. Mm, nice. And I'm very excited about it because we just, uh, just finished a deal that we'll be announcing soon. I want to hear about the deal. You kind of keep alluding to it. We'll talk after, off the line. So, and my last question to you, and I just want to say thank you so much for just being so open and so honest. And you are exactly the way here as you are on the show. Like, I am a true Tam fan thank here. You. I, I appreciate thank that. You. One of the things that I think a lot about as a Black mother, mm. I think about what is the story that my sons are going to say about me when I'm gone? How are they going to talk about me? And so I just want you to imagine for a second that you have run on ahead to see how the end is going to be, like my Nana would say. Yeah. What do you want your son to say about his mother's journey? My mother was a badass. There you go. That's there it. you go. That's there it. you go. That's it. <laughs> Tamron That's Hall, it. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, Tamron it. Hall. That's it. That's it.